In this podcast, we visit Studio Lab, a creative shared studio space in Derry, New Hampshire. Their team created an XR stage, complete with an LED wall powered by Unreal Engine, motion trackers, combining a bunch of technology and in-house expertise to make it all work. We sat down with Tim Messina, owner of Studio Lab, and Ian Messina, the director of video production, to discuss how their team is on the forefront of the next evolution of film production and event entertainment. All right, so today in our podcast, we're here at Studio Lab in Derry, New Hampshire, a creative shared space. We're actually on the East Coast, so we're not in Hollywood. Uh, and we're here with Tim and Ian. And behind us, we actually have an LED wall. So uh, Tim, do you want to tell us a little bit about what's behind us here? Yeah, so basically in our studio here, we're using LED wall to essentially transport uh, someone in real time to somewhere else. So think of it as... The video wall is a window into another world that we can create and then we can put you anywhere. So it could be on the moon, it could be in your living room if you wanted to do that. I mean, it could be anywhere you want to go and transport people in real time. So essentially what's happening is the world is rendered and it, it appears as the camera's moving that is in that space. Got it. And how did you guys create this? Because I know that this technology is being used in a bunch of different places, events and film, but tell me a little bit more about, you know, what inspired you to create this place and how you built it. Yeah, I mean, Studio Lab, going back to why we originally built it was essentially we wanted to create community where people that are you know, filmmakers or audio engineers, um, music creators, anybody that's in the kind of creative world have a spot where we could bring all of them together and collaborate. And you have a lot of uh, kind of sole entrepreneurs that are out there, and you have some bigger companies. And the idea is if we can mix them together, you can get, um, you, you can bring more to the table as a collective group that way. Mm -hmm. And that's why Studio Lab was originally built. Um, and, and because of our, um, our past, which is working in events, event technology, we had a lot of equipment um, that kind of we were able to utilize uh, because of COVID, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more, but essentially combining technology with the studio spaces uh, has allowed us to create an XR stage. Mm -hmm. And how long has this been uh, here? Like how many years? Uh, studio Lab we built almost three years ago. Um, so it's, it's relatively new. And, uh, but Events United, our company that's kind of funded this project for us that we've been working on, that's been around for 12 years. Wow, okay. And it's interesting, so you guys built this space before the whole world kind of turned upside down. Um, and it sounds like because of that, there's been a lot more interest in this kind of technology because you can do a lot of things in one place. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, we really got lucky with the timing of this project. I mean, the Studio Lab being built to bring creators together and having studio space along with already having equipment, um, and everything was kind of on the, the video side of things, right? So there's a video wall, there's cameras, um, you have lighting and audio. They're all part of our event company. And when COVID happens, we put a bet on the fact that, okay, at this point forward, at least for the next six months, this is back in March of 2020, that everything we do from this point forward is going to be video related. So what does that mean for us? Um, this has nothing to do with the XR stage yet. This was just doing something, you know, in, in here to, to some sort of events that were, um, uh, they had no people, no audience. So how do you still put an event on with no people? And so we made this into essentially what we call the virtual event stage right at the beginning when we were trying to pivot. And at that same time, um, we were supposed to be doing an event with Dropkick Murphys. And they ended up coming here for one of the first streams that happened during COVID. And that stream had over 40 million viewers on it. And it was one of the most live, uh, watched live stream in uh, concert in history. And it was a huge deal for us. It realized, we realized that there's options here we can kind of um, pursue in this video space a little bit more. And then uh, immediately after that, because we had the video wall set up as just a backdrop, Ian then came in and brought this idea of XR. You know, well, it wasn't XR at the time. It was just a um, virtual production, yeah. which he saw from The Mandalorian. Yeah, and that, that dropped around. I think everybody saw that. It was in March you know, of 2020. So... Um, you know, like Tim was talking about, there was a good six months of us knowing, you know, we don't know if events are coming back. We don't know, you know, if the commercial industry is coming back. So like, what do we spend our time on, you know, in this next six months at that point, not knowing it would turn into a year and now like a year and a half of just constant R&D. Um, so again, the circumstances really, 
you know, if, if COVID really didn't happen, you know, there was some, there's a lot of stuff that wouldn't allow us to collaborate on this level. Um, and just as you know, I think virtual production took off from that because of, you know, everybody's need and everybody's want to create virtually. And, and there was that need. I mean, nobody could film on, on location. Nobody could film on, film on site. Um, and I'd say September of like 2021, or sorry, September of 2020, we did our first virtual production in five, five different locations. And that was amazing to see because there's no way that commercial could have happened because there was a school, it was a, it was a construction site, it was a gym. nurse gym. Yeah. Like good luck getting in the middle of, you know, September as, as COVID's booming, good luck getting in any of those places. And it was for, um, it was for Velcro. So they had, a, they had a mask extender, they wanted to get out to the public. And we were able to shoot that five locations in, in under, I think in, 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 a day, in a day at that time. So that's where the need came out of. And, and as we saw it growing more and more in popularity, and Tim can tell you more about the things that he had talked about with other clients about doing, and, and that kind of forced us into the next level of like, hey, how do we make this better? Because, you know, the Mandalorian painted a beautiful picture of what this could be, and that's why we fell in love with it, is because it's like, look how amazing this is to create. Well, look all the things we can do. Um, but then you get into the weeds of it and get into like the actual blueprinting, the coding, the actual understanding of like all five or six different components that need to talk together and you need a whole team to run it. You need a whole group of people to go after this stuff. So well, yeah. And early on, I mean, there was just Crazy. night after night of us just banging our heads against the wall because nothing that you're seeing here has been easy by any stretch of the imagination. And it's taken extreme skill and knowledge and creativity from, um, like Ian said, a bunch of different people to be able to get where we are today. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So you guys mentioned Mandalorian, and I think that's created a lot of interest in this kind of technology just because, you know, it's Disney, it's it's Star Wars, it's, it's mm -hmm. huge. Can you guys tell me a little bit more about the difference between, you know, someone like Disney doing it on their video wall versus kind of recreating that here in an environment where you're actually doing it for customers, for events, for film? I mean, how does that translate, and how did you guys do it? Well, it's, it's completely di different on multiple ends because, you know, ideally when you're running these stages, we want, like, maybe three or four people to run it. Um, when you have, like people say, Disney money, you kind of throw a ton of money on it. You get us, and again, they, they were the fee first people to do it, so pioneering, figuring all this out makes sense. Um, but, you know, there's, there's you know, 10 or 20 people uh, at the Brain Bar, um, you know, from the stories that we've been told, it's it's kind of crazy being on a, a set like that. So you know, in in our world and our and how we want it to go, we want it to be as smooth as possible, as well as like if you have creatives and directors and DPs coming in for the first time to use this technology, that is definitely different as well. well um, you know, and it's so easy to kind of get scared away because yeah. there's so much technology in here. And so our goal from the beginning was how to make this easy for anybody to come in and participate in. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's still not easy. It's really that we have to do a lot of work up front to make it easy for them. Um, with that said, you know, we've also been working really hard from the beginning um, to, to make it kind of easier all around and, and, and working with manufacturers like Disguise directly. Mm -hmm. um, Disguise powers a lot of what you're seeing behind us. Um, they're, they're the ones that are kind of taking all the ins and the outs of all the signal chain and making it go up on the wall and then happening in real time. Uh, but at the same time with, with their software, the entire idea of XR has been so new that, I mean, honestly, the software at the beginning was really rough. Yeah, it was really very. hard to do. Some of the things that we're going to show you today were not even we possible. Were, yeah, we were, we were helping them just push that forward and... Um, their team has been amazing, um, but but them specifically is a big deal in this entire space. Mm -hmm. And then some of the others, um, I, <clears throat> tons of technology goes into this. Um, Unreal is is also a big part of it, right? When we look at these sets, um, you have to create these sets ahead of time, right? So this is yep. kind of what you guys are alluding to, this pre-production. Mm. So can you tell me a little bit more about how XR and this extended reality is shifting from post-production to pre-production yeah um so again i think looking at the start of a project and how people are used to it now again you go you shoot your green screen plates or whatever and everything does move into post-production and a more, majority of your time and your money is spent there if you're doing vfx work like this back plate type of effect so you know when you think about it and what people and producers are generally scared of is they see this this massive cost up front for, for, for pre-production but not realizing how much money and how much time they're saving in post-production. So there's a new learning that has to be there. And, and a lot of the times, you know, 
after you have a first production done with a company, they can then understand why it, why there's a difference. Because I remember we were on set with a, with a company and pretty much directly on site, we were making those decisions that you'd make in post. There was a wall that the client didn't know if they wanted green or blue. You know, it's very simple for us. Instead of having, you know, PAs go back there and paint that back wall, you know, 50 different shades of green, you know, you could dial it in and get it perfect. And then the client was able to okay with it and we moved on. And then at the end of the shoot, the, the ability for them to then just go right away into editing and the process there was, was huge for them. They're not spending an extra two, three weeks uh, in the post-production you know, like workflow trying to you know mask out somebody's hair because it doesn't look real enough um, and and again the the immediate feedback on site is another key key thing that is completely different from working more in uh, that post-production workflow instead of the pre-production uh, and I think the other thing too is just um, you mentioned unreal and specifically none of this works without a real-time 3d rendering machine Mm -hmm. So Unreal is the one that's chosen the most because it's the fastest with lighting. It is the most efficient. So when you think about what's happening in a scene and being able to light it, um, we do something called ray tracing where essentially um, if you brought a light like we have in our studio right now, we moved it around, that light's going to bounce off the table, it's going to bounce off the floor, it's going to bounce everywhere, right? And then it's going to bounce off the next surface, the next one. And you might have millions of reflections. You need to be able to calculate that in real time. In Unreal, can do that faster than anybody else. Another big one is Unity, but Unity definitely has some limitations in that specific yeah. issue with, with the speed of, with, that it can render or something. Um, and, and because Unreal has been used to make games in the past, it has A, a massive library of content that's already available. It's free mm -hmm. um, up to a, a, a certain, certain point, a certain <laughs> point, which would be for almost anybody hard to ever reach. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's accessible. And so you have something that is powerful, accessible, uh, it makes perfect sense to use that particular um, piece of software. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I was looking into um, Epic and kind of how the light, whole licensing works. What's interesting, and I'm looking at it from very high level, um, you don't pay for anything at first until you get to a certain level, right? So they've kind of made this... A million dollars you have to make, and then they'll take like a certain percentage after that. Right. Yeah. So yeah. The, the entry, like the barrier of entry is now much lower, which, mm. is, which is very exciting because... You know, for us, as you know, we run a YouTube channel, we, we look at this and we really start to think like, wow, we could start using this one day as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So it's no longer this, you know, Disney and Hollywood, you know, anyone has access to this technology. Right. I mean, that that's the beautiful thing. Yeah. It, it, and that's true. I mean, everyone has access to Unreal Engine if you have a computer. Um, and, the, and the reality is, is, you know, you don't need to have a crazy powerful computer to run it. Mm -hmm. To do what we're doing, you do. Right. We're, we're, we're talking about you know, 6K, 8K, 12K resolutions to put on the video walls, you need a lot of power to, put, to push that through. And yeah. again, that's where Disguise helps because their machines are designed to push a lot of information very fast. Yeah, but even from a design side, again, if you guys are looking to utilize this technology or somebody is and they're like, well, I'd love to do this, you know, again, Unreal's free, you know, and that's where it started for us. It was like, hey, I'm just curious. We actually, how we actually got into it was Matt Workman. Have you heard of him? He's I done a not. lot of stuff with Unreal, and he's creating an app called CineTracer. Basically, allows you to block out your scenes, um, and it's all being built around Unreal Engine. And so that was the first program we downloaded that was running off of Unreal just to do simple blocking. And I was like, well, it's running on Unreal. I'm just going to download Unreal and learn it. And from there, like if somebody's interested in utilizing this, we actually have somebody that's running uh, Unreal on their MacBook Pro 2016, and they're creating scenes, and then they're giving us the file, and we're just throwing it up. You know what I mean? It's not the most efficient workflow, but knowing that you can get a lot of work done on whatever machine you have just to learn the ins and outs um, is something that anybody can do. And it, it's really helpful when you have somebody who understands Unreal. They come into a space like this. Um, they kind of know what they're asking for at that point. Yeah, and let's actually um, maybe lay this out a little bit for people that might be interested. I mean, yeah. essentially, um, you know, if you wanted to build your own XR stage in your bedroom, your garage, or anywhere yep. that's kind of somewhere you already have, right? You don't need a lot of equipment. You need a computer, download Unreal Engine. The the price tag in this would be buying, which we would recommend is the Vive trackers, which are used for like... Um, um, any any sort of like I mean you play Beat Saber you know what I mean and and those are the hand trackers you can use or you can get one of the pucks that they they sell as well right so you you get the Vive trackers which you know you might have to pay a thousand dollars for these things right which are essentially going to track positional data mm -hmm. um, they're just little cameras you're going to put around your room and, and and track 
that information and you can you can even use your phone you don't even have to buy another camera mm-hmm. and you can put the tracker on your phone you can glue it on your tape and whatever you want whatever you do or you can 3d print something whatever <laughs> right i mean that's what we had done right yeah I mean, there was tape involved at some point oh yeah uh and and you can put that tracking information right into unreal and if you have a tv in your room a monitor any sort of a screen projector small projector, projector yeah you can then output from unreal onto the the um what's to say your wall in your room yeah or TV that you might have, and you can move the camera, your iPhone, and it will move in this 3D world, and your TV becomes a window into another world. Yeah, and like that's a really quick and, and rough, obviously you have to do some sort of configuration and, and, and understand th- some things, but it is very possible to get up and running if you wanted to mess around you know, with, with this technology. Um, it's very possible for somebody to just take their computer and just get going with it if they're that excited and that passionate for it. And I I should add too, it would be really smart for anybody to do that right now because the, uh, the amount of jobs out there and the lack of people that we can find to do this work in these stages is out of control. I know like Amazon and Sony Mm -hmm. and WB and Disney, they're all looking for more people. Yeah. And if you can have any understanding of how XR works. You it's, have a pretty good job. It's a leg up for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seems like everything's heading in this way. And what you guys have built here, I mean, it's super impressive. I got to tell you guys, when we walked in here, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, we saw the space. We were just like floored, right? And then that's why we're doing this podcast now because it's so impressive that, you know, we looked at each other. We said, we have to show this to the rest of the world, right? So that's why we're, we came here. We're doing a podcast. And what you guys were showing us before, and maybe we can do a little bit of this now, some of these trackers that you guys have built, we should talk about that um, because you guys have done some crazy stuff here. You guys have built out these trackers. Yeah. You guys can move these, you know, move the cameras around. So tell me a little bit more and maybe you can show some of this. Yeah. Do, do we want to do that real quick? Yeah. Well, hey, John, why don't you, can you just push the slider over here and we can show them. So those of you that are actually watching the video, um, basically, we're going to show you what this tracker looks like and what it is. Um, around our studio right now, there's the, these blue rings that um, you can't see right now, but they are cameras. And those cameras are tracking this device that um, Aaron built in-house. Um, and it's, it's tracking the movement of LEDs on it. So it kind of looks like, a, um, like an X pattern, and at the end of each X, there's a white LED dot. And that dot is being tracked. And that's giving us positional information in our studio of where we are. Um, and I can actually take this off. Yeah. And what it's really doing is it's triangulating the position uh, of where we are in 3D space for our room. So our room has a zero, zero point in the 3D world and as well as our physical world. So Right. What he's saying is basically <laughs> we, we can align the digital world and, and our the real physical, world yeah. off of the zero, zero point, which we typically use the concrete. There's a line on our concrete that is very much not moving. And we use that as the point so that every time it's identical. Now, um, for those of you who can't see, I'm moving the tracker in my hand around. Um, and by moving it, the video wall is updating in real time. If I move closer in the scene, I can start to see around objects, like there's a, a um, um, electrical pole and some other things. I can, in, if John, if you actually want to move this closer, we can see around them. Yeah, this is amazing. And so what are some of the applications? Like, walk me through, um, Maybe some of the projects you guys have done where you know you're you're do using this stuff uh, for a shoot. Well, yeah, I mean, Ian mentioned Velcro already. Mm-hmm. Um, using it for a commercial shoot is is um, really useful, just because the amount of scenes and locations you can go to in a very short amount of time. Um, we had our friends from Big Brick Productions come in, and they did a shoot for Hasbro, which Hasbro makes Monopoly. Mm-hmm. The shoot was for Monopoly, uh, and this it, this one was about the um, community chess deck. Yep. Um, they're changing yeah so if you actually google community chess deck and watch a video you can see this on youtube um but the idea was we could shoot these five different locations there's bedrooms and a lot of houses and stuff um the board stayed in the same spot the entire time but the worlds are changing the people are changing and we could shoot that whole thing in like six hours yeah something like that and i think they had full so basically there's two days and, and to get in a bit more of the workflow because we find ourselves working with um, you know, the production companies and helping them understand what this workflow is because it's so different. Um, so, you know, right off the bat, they wanted six locations. And I was like, well, 
you know, with the budget that we have, let's try three, but let's try and flip 180 degrees around. And what happened, like you'd, you'd have a shot and you can actually see it if you look at the ad. You know, we had full three locations that were digital, but we had a, a full six locations because we were able to spin the world 180 degrees on the dime and none of our cameras were moving. So, you know, for us to be on set, and again, this was January, I believe. So again, right in the middle, kind of getting out of COVID, um, you know, we were able to bring all six actors in and time align it. So we only had an actor for an hour each. So we'd bring an actor in, shut the world out, bring the new world up. And the art department came in and dressed their sets with the physical and the, the digital sets. So um, it looks kind of similar to a real world set. Um, but what happens is you have all of your art department lighting, grip, uh, gap, everybody's looking at the scene and going, how can we make this better? Because they can see the final output. So I remember there was a one moment where, you know, the, the guys in charge of, charge of lighting were, were looking at the scene and, and looked at the window and saw that the window was coming at more of a 45 degree angle. So they just went over and moved the light, you know, a couple feet that way. And it, it looked more realistic. And you could see that light that they added hint and hit off the desk and tie in. Now, if that was green screen, there's no way you can light that, you know, unless you do some sort of pre-visualization, which would be virtual production at that point. Um, but it's very intuitive. There's a lot of trial and error that we find. Um, and, and that's huge for us is like, how many more iterations can you get when you're working with creatives? Because we want to see the end result as quickly as possible. Um, so everybody can get on the same page and go, how can we elevate this image? How do we make this look even better? Um, or how do we make it look worse? And the only reason why I say that is sometimes these these worlds are too perfect. <laughs> so how do you make it look like, like it's not as sterile or how do we make it look like this is, this room has been used a, a bit more. So that's always an interesting back and forth when your, your director goes, this looks way too clean because it can look very good, but you need to introduce a bit of uh, movement or elements to make it not look so like just, just like a perfect picture. Yeah. And I guess, um, if, if, you, if you want, we can talk a little bit about the technical parts of, you know, how all this works, right, and, and the ease of use. Um, Ian and John have been working on um, this iPad app, which is essentially using Touch OSC, mm -hmm. but, y you know, you can talk about a little bit more about the control you get with it. Yeah, so pretty much, and this, I guess, if anybody is at home, I guess we'll, we'll give you um, a good view into it, um, or we'll grab an over-the-shoulder over shot. Um, of it, but I'll just kind of go over what the actual um, control is because it can change from person to person. So right now we have, uh, you know, I'll, I'll change it up right now, but time of day control. So if you're actually looking at the video right now, we're actually changing the time of day real time and we can go from day to night. We also have the sun over there. Uh, let me try and find it. Looks like it's over there. And I'm going to spin the sun so it, it goes flying by in the sky here. You mean, um, you mean spin the world? Yeah, no, spin not. the world. Spin the world. You're getting specific <laughs> here. But <laughs> you can kind of see that everything's updating, you know, real time. Now, you know, this is what we saw in The Mandalorian. It's like, all right, this guy is coming. He's spinning things. He's changing the location, saturation, you know, star intensity. So these are the basic controls that your average DP is going to want on location. Show them, uh, make it cloudy in just so, change the environment. Yeah, for sure. So um, we can take the clouds out completely. Um, actually, let's just go to night real quick. And you're seeing, um, right now we have an auto exposure on, but you can, you can shut that off and be specific with it. Um, you also have a sky intensity, so we can bring the sky brightness up as, and, and completely lower it. Um, we can bring the stars out and make that look like something amazing, or we can take them all back. So any parameter that you want to control in this world, we can do for you, but you need to let us know you want control over that because we need to do something called an expose a parameter. So anything in a video game, yes, you can manipulate it, but as long as we know ahead of time that you want control over it, we can then take this iPad app and give you that easy control. Um, for those of you at home who are even more interested in control, this can be all DMX'd and time-coded um, so that, for instance, a lighting change happens in the digital world, will DMX, um, you know, a fade to go from night to day with all of our lights in the studio. Um, so when you jump from scene to scene to scene, everything updates real time. And when you're on set, you know, there's no downtime. You had that first pre-light day previously to, to make all your changes. And then just, you know, we're talking about this iPad and, and part of the reason we have this is because the first things we said was, how do you make something more usable and easy that's not easy? So Ian just showed you how he can change the world and he can manipulate any, any parameters that he exposed into the iPad essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and 
and then change those. But it also, with the iPad, we wanted more than that. And so being able to control our studio, right now I'm controlling one of the lights in our studio, um, and I can change everything about it, right? And it should be changing color right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and by doing that, it means that we could hand one person an iPad, and they can control the world that they see in digitally and the physical world in front of them from one person. So you don't have to go to a bunch of different people and talk about this. It's all done in one spot. Um, and, and I guess while we're on this as well, there's, um, there's a lot of difficult things we've had to kind of um, go through to get where we are today. Um, one of them, and, and I want to talk about events because, um, you know, I don't mind if you're right if I jump ahead to yeah, events. Yeah, Let's talk about events. Well, events matters, right? This is, um, <clears throat> there's two big spaces that can use this technology. We had the film industry, which is blowing up. The, the use case is very clear. We can replace green screen with this. We can mm-hmm. give actors real time information of where they actually are, not how to see green screen. Those make sense. But knowing that we've been using video wall for events for a long, long time, um, what kind of possibilities does this bring for the event world? And that's one of the conversations we started having. And in the middle of COVID, a lot of our clients that were already, um, we would go to the events and let's say they were at an arena or at a, a, a ballroom, wherever they were, they wanted to uh, be able to do their event virtually. Um, one of them uh, was a company called Connection, uh, formerly PC Connection, and they're based here in New Hampshire. And they wanted to kind of push this technology to beyond what we thought like we could do at the um, time. This yeah. was very, very early. Um, so they had an event that was going to happen in, in the following January. And this conversation happened in going backwards in July. Now we had not done anything with XR until really September, April, May. No, yeah. no, no, no. Before that going oh, back, yeah, yeah, yeah. April, May is when we, we, you kind of had the idea of, can I try some stuff with the LED wall? Mm-hmm. Right. And I remember having the conversation with uh, Rob over at Connection. He's saying, you know, tell me what this can, this can all do. At the time, I had some thoughts, but it wasn't apparently that accurate. And, and uh, he said, all right, well, it's really important to us that we have at least three, three cameras. Because every other event that we've ever done has always had a lot of cameras. And I said, uh, yeah, no problem. Like, you have as many cameras as you want, right? We're just, we have a studio. We have all these cameras. We, we can make this fairly simple. And I, at the time I had the conversation, I was out at an event and I came back and I told Ian, I said, this is what they want to do. Uh, I think I was talking to John as well. And, uh, and they said, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. You want to use more than one camera? I was like, well, yeah. I mean, just like we always do. I'm like, yeah, but think about this. On the video wall, we're looking at the perspective from one camera, right? So as we look through that perspective in that camera, the world appears correct. To where we are right now in our eye, the world looks okay, but if we walk around, we're not getting a parallax effect. We're not seeing what we'd expect in that world, but that camera that's moving, um, John, why don't you move a little bit so we can kind of see this. Um, the perspective on that camera is right. So that means that if I switch to this other camera, we have another one on the jib up here, that its perspective is now wrong. So if I switched, you would not have this working. And this was the problem. They're like, so you promise something that can't be done. Like, how are we supposed to have two perspective at once? And the way that we fixed that, um, this was our beginning of our discussions with Disguise, and mm-hmm. ultimately why we had to buy Disguise, was we had to essentially, um, I can't see the wall, so when you do this. Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, be able to time align the camera switch. So when we switch cameras, at the exact same moment that the video wall feed switches. So think about the timing that this has to be. It has to happen in the exact same frame. Now, this was a giant problem because how are you supposed to time align something to a frame, which is, you know, roughly a... a uh, I mean, we're shooting 30 frames a second. You got to hit it on that 1 30th of a frame or you're, <laughs> you're blowing the magic trick out of the water. So It doesn't work. And yeah. we, in, in disguise, told us they had a solution for this. As we found out, it didn't work. Not anywhere close to what they made it sound like. And that ultimately is why we worked so closely with them for two straight weeks. I say we like I did something. I didn't actually do anything. But Ian and John spent two straight weeks working with Disguise on making this fine tune. We weren't actually to this point working on this until like December. And the event was in January. Mm -hmm. And we realized it wasn't working. Now we can technically switch up to 16 cameras. And I mean, things have come such a long way. The power of Disguise using OptiTrack system, which is the tracking system in our building to be able to do this. That was one big hurdle. I mm-hmm. mean, we really had to think about how do we overcome this? And ultimately, yeah. that was it. 
Um, just real quick, there's a second way uh, that this can work. I'll let you talk about it from Brompton if you just want to mention it. Uh, yeah, I mean, right now there's something out there called Ghost Frame, and what that allows you to do is take, you know, your four cameras, three cameras, and what it does, and we'll try and make this as, as easy to visualize as possible, is, you know, say everything, everybody, every one of the cameras is running at 30 frames per second. And what it will do, it will flash three frames and will gen lock each individual frame to each individual camera. So camera one, camera two, camera three are seeing three different, th three different things all at the same time. So you could potentially do it. Now, the issue with that is what does the actor see on stage? You might, you know, if, if anybody has any issues with, you know, bright flashing lights, it could be <laughs> lead to a problem. Um, you know, some say that it's not that distracted and, and it, it might not be, but there is always that issue of if there's not one thing flashing up on the screen, what are you actually looking at? Because right. um, your rock or your whatever you want them to look at could be in six different places at once um, and, and flashing in, in different orientations. So there are different solutions and that's the cool stuff about this technology is the industry is moving so quickly and so fast that there's always updates happening, you know, on Unreal side and on uh, Disguise's side. Um, and there's better ways to do it. And as everybody knows, Unreal Engine 5 is coming out. And, you know, there's some amazing lighting uh, potential as well as what they're doing um, on the back end for how large we can build these worlds now um, and the collaboration. There's a lot to be said with how virtual production is changing the way that 3D artists and, and, and people working in all these 3D um, you know, softwares are going to collaborate in the future. And it's really exciting to see um, the potential not only for the film side, but the potential for every you know, industry that utilizes um, a lot of this uh, 3D technology. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So I'm just wondering, what does it take to build an environment like this, the virtual world? And we're looking at this world here, yeah. a train station somewhere. Tell me a little bit about you know, how do you create this world? Who builds it? How do you build it? How long does it take? Yeah, because there is a different level. So right now, this is actually, you could actually go download this scene from the marketplace. So real quick, we, we had, you know, thrown this scene in. Um, and actually, we're, we have Matt here um, from another studio working. And, and he put this scene together um, in roughly about like an hour, hour and a half. And, you know, I'd say the biggest thing is understanding what that you want. You know, there's, there's so many things as far as getting the scene ready. If we're just talking about the 3D world. You know, you have to think about the meshes and, um, you know, all the textures that need to be applied, um, as well as how the scene is even going to be lit. You know, there's five or six different ways from ray tracing to static lighting um, to a hybrid of both that can be done per the scene. So I guess it matters what the request is from the actual creatives. Um, so if they want dynamic control, then we're going to have to go ray tracing, but that's going to limit how large the world is built because you're always balancing between quality and, um, you know, the, the actual, what's the best way, quality and performance, I guess is the best way to put it. If you want a, a high quality, you know, render, you're not going to be able to get, hit that 60 frames and get a, a smooth motion. Um, so you are balancing back and forth. Um, and you also have to optimize these scenes. A lot of the times we'll get a scene and it'll run at like 15 frames a second. And as you're moving the, the fresh of it, you're jittering all over the place. Everything's not looking right. So, it does require a lot of you know work uh, before you get it on the screen to make it look at how it does now. And, and real quick, just because there's going to be terms that we're just going to say, no one knows what we're talking about. Uh, Frussum, which is what yes. you just said, essentially when the camera is looking at the video wall, there's a box that is what the camera sees. It's high resolution rendered. Um, and then everything outside that box is called the outer Frussum. It's outside the, the view of the camera. And that's all going to be lower resolution. Um, the only reason you would have an outer frustum, if the camera doesn't see it, why do we have it? It's because if um, the Mandalorian was a great example because of his armor being so shiny, you need to see the reflections off of that. And the rest of the world needs to be rendered for those reflections. Mm. And again, the reason both of them are different too, with the outer frustum, again, it can be rendered at 1080, a very low quality, because off of the reflections, you're not going to notice you know, a, a, a tiny detail. Um, so you do have control over both of those as well. Yeah, that's interesting. So when does it make sense to use virtual production and when does it not? Because I'm sure you, ha you guys have all yeah. sorts of people coming in with crazy ideas. Well, <laughs> how do you guys handle all well, this? Well, there's actually uh, a couple different things there. I mean, so, I, and, and I say that like, okay, there's specific shoots that just don't make sense to do here, mm -hmm. right? It's A, it's not cheap. Nothing in this world is cheap. The equipment is incredibly expensive. The, the amount of people it takes to run it, it's right, it's, it's labor intensive. Um, 
so if you're going to shoot, like, let's say, a virtual version of someone's living room, it might just make more sense to go to someone's living room and shoot it because the cost actually might be cheaper. Mm. But if you had to shoot six living rooms in the same day, it might make more sense to come into the studio because mm-hmm. of time savings as you have that point. Um, and also the flexibility with the studio environment with, you know, I mean, air yeah. conditioning and, and other, you know, lighting's dead on. Um, in, I, I feel like what's happening lately is XR is kind of like this shiny new toy and everybody wants it. And we're having a lot of big companies come to us and saying like, come build us a stage. And we really have honest conversations with them. Like, why are you building this? Like, what do you think you can do with the stages you can't do mm. now? Like, if you're using green screen, um, yeah, it'll make your life better. You don't have to deal with keying out the green color, the green cast that comes on to objects and people. Um, but is it worth a million dollars? It depends on what you're doing and how often you're using it. It might be. Mm. Um, the technology, you know, there's more options than just video wall. Video wall itself is expensive and that's really where the price is going up and the processing power. There are other ways to do this. And we mentioned the TV and stuff. Um, but you ultimately, when you're talking about a stage like this, it's, it's cost prohibitive sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And I think if, if you're really, again, there's two different categories. There's people who actually want to build these stages, you know, and then there's people that want to use it. And, um, you know, on the, on the building side of it, it does make sense if you do have clients who want, and you have a studio that you want to be able to teleport people, quote unquote, to different locations, you know. Um, but then, you know, when a, a company comes to us and has, you know, a great idea behind it, you know, we really do have to ask, you know, what, what are the reasons for using it right off the bat so we don't go down this long process of trying to solve a problem that we really don't need to solve. And I think the, the earlier you figure that out, the, the better they can go back and either develop a creative around it and and it, it needs to help you know what i mean if if this ultimately hinders your creative process and it makes it way worse than it could be if you just shot it on location don't use it yeah. you know what i mean so there are a lot of things you have to kind of weigh and go you know is is this something also sometimes people go way over their heads too and go oh we can do this and that and this and that you know and they plan their whole creative based off of way too much and you know unfortunately they have a bad experience with it and they're like oh you know why'd we do that you know it's like well yeah and there's like limitations that you have to consider in this environment that i don't think that everyone really would consider um think about the fact that led wall is light essentially we're looking at a bunch of little lights that are pointing back at us Mm. um in the real world um you get reflections off of uh, other objects i'm thinking about if there is say a tree behind me the sun is behind the tree shining through to the camera, that tree on on the on my side is relatively black. It's not going to be light. In this case here, the LED wall is still going to emit some light back at you, which is not quite natural. But more importantly, if you some stages have an LED wall floor, and we decided not to have an LED wall floor um, because light would never come from the ground. So, I mean, well, I guess it could, um, but not the but, way. But, that. but typically, you're going to have a reflection off the ground yeah. that's light, right? But the ground typically absorbs most light that hits, a lot of light that hits it. Um, and with an LED wall floor, it just makes it look really, really fake, um, depending on the scene you're doing. If you're trying to do like a broadcast studio that would have a flat, shiny floor anyway, yeah, sure, do it. that works. Outside of that, if you're trying to recreate like a mountain scene like a lot of people have done, you can see right through it. And the fact is that if a light, let's say the sun is shining on you, it creates a shadow off of your body to the ground if the floor is lighting that shadow up, it will never look real. Yeah, and you can do calculated shadows, like there's, you know, there's softwares where you can track the individual and then put a 3D shadow, but there's issues with that as well. You know, there's, there's latency. If you start walking right and it doesn't calculate quick enough, it looks like you got a second shadow following you, so. Actually, and that was a great point you just said too, is latency. That's yeah. another big issue with this, and it will never be perfect, ever. Can't. There will always be some latency. The system that we're using here, to just give you an idea of speed, so it's, it's using, um, uh, some of our machines have some of the fastest GPUs on the market. Um, and then out of those GPUs, out of those computers, we're going through a fiber network. There's no HDMI cables. There's no SDI cable. It's all fiber through the entire network. And the reason for that is speed. And by keeping it light, which is what fiber is the entire way, you can minimize latency. But even with that, so no speed will ever be faster than light. It's impossible. So we have to be limited by that, and there's going to be processing power that has to happen somewhere, which means that if you move the camera, you're going to get some delay when you move the camera 
when you update an object in real time and you're moving something that has to react to, let's say that we put a motion capture suit in somebody and, and things in that world have to react to that person's movement, you have some delay and that will always be there. In the yeah. real world, with you not having to digitize everything, that would never be a problem. Yeah, and All you right. can get it close, but again, like you're saying, the fact that you're limited by the speed of light is, is very interesting to, to kind of be up against, so. <laughs> Yeah, that ex that's very interesting. So when when is it a good, a great use case? Like, tell me about some examples that you guys have done here, clients and other projects where it's been like a great example of using something like this for production. Yeah, I think I think again, like it comes down to you know going to multiple different locations a day is a huge one. Um, and then again, if you have time constraints, you know that's that's a massive one. If you want a specific time of day that you're shooting at. Um, again, overall, if you're, if you are a director or a DP or whoever that wants a lot of control throughout the whole scene down to, you know, where a train is placed or where a mountain is, you know, that those are the things that are cool. You know, you can get down to, you know, there are some dangerous scenes that you can shoot here. There's one where, um, I have a friend, uh, Madison, who's a great aerialist and we're like, well, let's go shoot something like over this Canyon or over these rocks. And, you know, from a visual effects standpoint, you know, having her come up there and, and seeing what she's, um, kind of doing her, her work around is, is a really cool, um, to work with. And right. then Tim can go into more of the events too, that you can take this technology cause there that's opening up a totally different ball game. Right. Well, even before I get there, I was just going to say like with Madison, when, mm -hmm. when we can, so the question would be like, well, why don't you just use green screen if you want to put her somewhere crazy like that? Well, a, we don't have to key out the entire world, but more importantly, she feels like she's in that environment. Yeah. And so she, while she's doing your routine, she can be a little bit more immersed in that. Um, yeah. And the, t on the event side, I mean, it's just wild what you can do. Um, you know, taking that event from Connection, it was, we were able to bring in their executives, their CEOs onto a stage that was built to match the world that they had built. Um, but ultimately what they built was a city yeah. and it was a skyscraper and there was this elevator that would go up and down different levels inside that skyscraper. So different rooms. So, you, you know, one, one level was like bricks and one was the roof and one was the basement and you know, mm -hmm. different areas in this thing. But it would all move in real time. And so when the executives were standing in here, they felt like they were in these environments and it was really immersive. There was, and it, the more important thing about that is because we weren't using green screen, we didn't have to live key anything. It was all happening live to the internet. There was no, you know, post time. That, mm -hmm. that was one of the biggest challenges that we've had is how do we do this live so that millions of people can see this at the exact same time without failure and that was what we really worked on to push this. And by doing that, we now have stuff like the iPad app and other stuff that makes the film world even easier. Got it. So you guys are like way ahead of, it seems like to us, you guys are way ahead of, of this whole, all this technology and, and this movement. Um, I'm sure people are coming to you asking you all sorts of questions about how do I do this? How do I do it well? Um, tell me a little bit more about how you guys are helping others uh, build their kind of productions and LED walls and XR stages. Yeah, from a company perspective, um, we, 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 we've always had an installation integration department. That's always, you know, a lot of churches come to us for sound, lighting, and, and video, um, and theaters and stuff. But for this specifically, um, we really focused on the technology. How does it work, and how does it become easier to use? Whereas, you know, Ian really wants to be working on the creative. Like that, that's his, his, his dream is just to work on creative. Mine is more technical. Um, in our team here is just is kind of built that way. Um, and so we kind of pursued the technical aspect of all of this and pushed a lot of this um, into a more accessible realm, I guess. Um, and uh, but ultimately what that allows is in, on Ian's side is now he has a studio that is very functional that he can kind of do some things he wants to in it because again, he's a filmmaker. Um, but you know the the big core thing that we do now is design and install these studios, these stages around the United States. Um, we have a handful of them we're working on right now. Some of them are big names. Um, I, I don't really want to talk about who they are right now, but um, but we're also working with a lot of smaller ones too. And and there's just a lot of cool projects that we're being asked to do because ultimately we can bring this technology and make it function. And that's where a lot of other companies are kind of struggling. And our goal is to help everyone do this because it's not easy. And we've been through the ringer trying to figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Um, you know, Industrial Light and Magic, who ILM, who did The Mandalorian, um, like Ian had said at the beginning of this, they have a huge team. They struggled 
in a you know in a big way to make this happen and it's amazing what they did and they made it look easy and i can promise you that it wasn't easy for them they really had to work hard to get there um, but now we're getting to a place where this is more accessible and can be easier got it so if i'm a company or a studio and i'm thinking about doing this what do i need as a team because it sounds like you need mm. some talent, right? So can you like tell a me a little base. bit? Yeah, <laughs> tell me a little bit more so, about the people required and the skills. Yeah, I mean, like a general breakdown. If we're if we're gonna look at it from just a day production, you know, you're gonna have a couple people on set. You know, in in the perfect world, you have somebody on tracking that is is just focused on making sure there's no blips or or errors, or if they see a camera out of focus, they can fix that. Um, so having a, a person who understands that is is one person you need. Um, they also need to be able to create trackers as well, which has been extremely helpful. They, they don't have to be. Able to, we we got the benefit of Aaron being that is true. Being talented in that he can three D design objects, think about the need, and actually build them. build it. Yeah. yeah. So again, you have somebody on tracking. Um, you have somebody on the networking and the sky side of it. So almost like a technical director, understanding how all the computers talk to each other. Um, and, and that is John. John's done an amazing job uh, on our end for programming everything, getting everything to talk. And then you see, need somebody in Unreal. Um, that person usually um, is taking a lot of the direction from the DP and the director as far as what they're looking for. Um, and then generally you need somebody who's going to kind of oversee all that and be able to talk and, and communicate to that team as far as like what they need done. So that would be the director of virtual production. So they would kind of talk with the, the director, say, hey, what do you need done? And then they would translate that into other terms so that everybody on the technical side can make that happen. And that's like a, your general three-person team, four-person team. Again, if you can have a, an LD on set who's going to be doing more of the lighting, um, that's huge as well because a lot of the stuff we trigger is from DMX. And that is more of an event side thing and in the film side. But um, you know, having a good team of four to five with, with this setup is something that we would definitely recommend. And that's, that's just the XR part. I yeah. mean, you still need your, your other people that are, are doing lighting, the grips, gaffers, yep. um, and then audio, right? I mean, there's, and the camera operators, there's still a whole team. This is added to it, but the, yep. the savings becomes in post-production. You've done most of that work up front. You're basically just taking what used to be in the end and keying out green screen. You're now moving to the very, very beginning stages and that gets everybody else on the set on the same page of what's happening in real time. Yeah, got it. So I want to talk a little bit about where this is heading because it sounds like a lot has happened in just a few years. Um, and I can only imagine where we're going to be in five, ten years from now. Where do you guys see this heading? Mm. Yeah. So uh, you want me to take this one? I mean, if you go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So some of this is... Um, you, you think about the use case of what this is and what we're doing. Um, if we look at the event space, I've had this kind of vision from the very beginning of, okay, there's the big issue is all XR right now is from one perspective. So it only works in a film set, really, if you have a camera looking at that. But how do more people experience uh, something at the same time? So let's say you're at an arena, you have 20,000 people. How does everyone experience something three-dimensional at the same time? Uh, I don't have an answer yet, so don't don't think I'm about to give you an answer. But uh, <laughs> it's it's the idea of okay, this technology is here now. We know that people don't like to put goggles on their face, so we can use displays in a different way that are not necessarily attached to you. Or maybe there's a way that we can um, make something that's more involved. Like one of the things um, early on that I thought about was okay, we're we're going to all these venues and they keep putting plexiglass in front of people for COVID. Like, what if those were actually um, OLEDs and they're screens that you can see through, but you could actually have some sort of XR generative uh, content, generative content yeah. on it in front of you, which means you could overlay things in front of you over a live performance that's happening. Extremely expensive, but just like the technology would uh, technically allow to do that with a whole lot of processing power. Because remember, you'd have to do everybody's viewpoint mm. from their perspective. Um, and then uh, there's... A bigger play here, just to wrap your head around everything, is to really consider uh, w where industries are going with the metaverse. Um, this is really important. It's um, it's where our future is going. Essentially, the metaverse is many different companies kind of coming together, creating a virtual version of our real world with additional content that can be added to it. Um, so by, you know, Google and Apple 
uh, giving us phones. They know a ton of information of where we are location-wise, and they can now kind of map out the world. Your your phone location is really important because in in mapping out uh, the world incredibly accurately, we need to understand people's movements and how we behave. Um, you you kind of combine with where the metaverse is going, what it will become. This technology is at the very front of it because it's allowing us to see into that world in in real time. So picture at home now with your TV. Um, they already have eye trackers, which means you don't need to put something on your face. It can track your eye position just from a camera looking at you. So it knows your, your movement. So if you move and you have your TV in your room, you could technically kind of see inside of this world. Again, the problem is still multiple people. And once we get over this hurdle of how do more people experience the same thing at once, um, it's not going to massively take off. So, um, and that's why like Google Glass is a, is a thing. The Oculus is a thing. But up to now, it's too cumbersome to put something on your face and people don't want to. So yeah. this is what it's allowing us to kind of break out of that. Um, yeah. And then the, the rendering side of everything right now, we're bringing the digital world to our physical world. I think we're going to be taking our physical world and putting it into our digital world in the future. Yeah. Um, and well, we're already doing that with something called mega scans. Exactly. Um, essentially, uh, let's just take this headphone amplifier that's in front of us right now. Uh, if I take a mega scan of this, I'm actually basically taking LIDAR scan and taking full measurements and um, uh, texture readings of the entire surface there. And then you can bring that mesh, that information into, say, Unreal or a different program, and you can then make it look identical to what this is. Now we have real-world objects going into to there. Then you've seen this a lot with you know, tree trunks and mm -hmm. other kind of um, organic assets um, where we scan them in. The problem is not a lot of people can do that right now. It's time-consuming. Mm -hmm. Sony is working on something right now that is incredibly high resolution. Like, your eye can not even really see some of the resolution we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, that'll be coming out soon. Um, so y there's there definitely a lot in this space, but Ian's right. It's really going to be bringing our physical world into the digital world and vice versa. Um, real quick, when I say vice versa, we can bring augmented reality into our studio right now if we wanted to. We could essentially have the camera see things floating in our space that were actually back in the video wall. A great example of this was um, early tests that Ian did with a classroom. There was an apple hanging from the ceiling in this, in this children's classroom. And... <laughs> Uh, he was he was up on a ladder, and he was going to just kind of grab this apple and bring it down. But he was standing out where we are, which is about 30 feet from the video wall right now. And at one point, his hand went through this apple. Now, the apple appeared to be in the size, inside of a regular apple, right? But as soon as he put his hand through it, remember, the apple's on the, on the video wall. The apple is actually like eight feet wide on yeah. the video wall to make it look like it was up here. And so then the illusion is completely gone. So there's some forced perspective that happens there, yeah. and, and, and that is something that you can get away with as long as you don't break that, that fourth wall, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, last real quick thing on future of kind of where this is going. Um, John, do you mind um, grabbing the video wall? Um, and maybe uh, Chase, can you give him a hand? So one thing we've seen quite a bit is the camera tracking in The Mandalorian, and you're seeing the, the world shift um, based on the camera's perspective. But what if we could actually move the, the video wall physically and the scene, essentially, we're, we're now using the, the physical location of the wall as a window into another world. And this opens up a whole lot of, um, go ahead and turn it towards the, uh, us a little bit. Um, you might see it jitter because we might lose tracking back there. But essentially, they're moving the video wall, but the scene is staying still. And this shouldn't happen. What should happen is, let's say that there was an image on there, it should just track with them. They're physically moving something, it should stay with it. But no, it's becoming a window into this other world. And now we think about, okay, now how do we use this in, in film and events? Because this is new. This is something that hasn't really been done yet. Um, so think about it. If, if we had to film, this actually was an issue of why we brought this up. There was a, a feature film that was gonna have a portion filmed in our studio. And it was a, a, um, a scene that was a, um, uh, basically, the, the movie had already been shot in Germany. It's a pickup shot. It was a pickup shot. It had to be done here. Uh, it was all shot in Unreal Engine, and the actress had to walk an 80-foot walk. And we're, our studio isn't isn't big enough to do that. So we're thinking about also how much video wall would that take for her to walk along this scene, have the Unreal scene play back of the actor she's walking next to. We wanted her to be able to make eye contact with him. So how are they going to communicate back and forth without building more video wall? Well, what if the video wall could move with her and we could roll it alongside her as she's walking and the scene is updating inside there, the person is walking next to her, 
well, now we just built a studio that could be a thousand feet long and only have 30 video wall tiles. And we have, Greg, think about, you know, if you had a thousand foot walk of just video wall, you're talking about millions and millions of dollars of video wall. Mm. But go down to 30 video wall tiles and just move it. I mean, the, you just saved so much money. Um, and not only that, if we use this for events, you actually can now, the people watching it can actually see, as you just saw, right? It didn't move. You had an experience there that wasn't possible before. And so now opens more doors. Wow. I mean, that's amazing. We just saw it, saw it in action here. Uh, Ian, any other uh, last thoughts of kind of the future of where all this is heading? Yeah. I, I mean, from the beginning, it was we, we wanted to see the collaboration. Like the, the real reason why I got ex excited was the collaboration, you know, and I, I saw on the, you know, behind the scenes of like all of these creatives working together, you know, and, and trying to create something that wasn't made before. So what we'll see in the next couple of years is a lot of these software companies and, and right now NVIDIA is working some working on something called the omniverse which essentially will create the metaverse and that can be another conversation from another time but um you know when it comes down to it we're going to see a lot more collaboration on on the pre-production side than we ever have before and then we talk about what on set looks like in the future um you know i would love to see a day where you know people are working from different parts of the world seeing stuff update on the video wall live um you could have five or six artists you know working remotely um and and the director's just on a headset calling stuff out and it changes almost instantaneously um so yeah there's there's a lot of exciting things that i think are looking good for the future um and as this technology evolves i think i'm we're just we're just gonna be along for the ride and, and hopefully can can help bring that technology to the next level as well that's amazing guys and we're super excited to be here and and for you guys inviting us over to experience this and uh record this podcast so uh for all the listeners out there if you're watching us on youtube Make sure to tell us uh, what you thought of this. Put some comments down below. Let us know what you want to see in the future because we will definitely be back here. Uh, and thank you so much, Tim and Ian, for hosting us here. And uh, we're really excited to see where this is going to head in the future. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you.